and gentlemen, welcome to the World Economic Forum Turkey Summit. We are at the session Regional Geopolitical Challenges, Multi-Stakeholder Response Strategies. In the context of the geopolitical challenges posed to the region and the growing threat of non-state actors, how can government, business and civil society organizations best respond? These are some of the topics we're going to discuss today. And the dimensions we're going to be addressing today are, one, identifying the dynamics and drivers of growing geopolitical risk in our region, adapting to the economic repercussions of regional conflict, and finally, assessing the prospects of a regional solution to the conflict in the Middle East. I have five very prominent guests with me. I'd like to introduce them to you. To my left is Mr. John Hefko. He is the General Secretary and CEO of Rotary International. And right next to him is Mr. Ashte Havrami, uh, Minister of Natural Resources of Kurdistan Regional Government in Iraq. To his left is Mr. Junaid Zapsu, who is the chairman of Junaid Zapsu Consulting. To his left, we have uh, Philip Misfelder, CDU, CSU, foreign policy spokesperson in the Bundestag. And to his left is the Mr. Efkan Ala, Minister of Interior Affairs of Turkey. Welcome all to the session. We're very happy to have you with us. Uh, Mr. Hafko, let me start with you as you're uh, sitting right to my left. We are in a very difficult region, everyday crisis happening. Obviously, you're heading an organization with over uh, millions of members, and uh, you are active in 200 countries. Rotary is very strong as a civil society organization. Um, let me start with Syria and the conflict in the region. Uh, your previous job was also about uh, uh, distributing foreign aid as part of the US government, so you know conflict areas very well. Can I ask you to draw us the big picture? What's going on in the Middle East? Some of, what are some of the areas that you see more problematic? Well, obviously, the, there are significant challenges in the region, as, as, as we all know. Uh, what I'd like to perhaps focus on, uh, if, if I could maybe frame it, is from a, from a civil society perspective. Uh, the challenges we face, and what are some of the, the, the problems we face from a, from a uh, from a particularly global health perspective. Um, we have significant conflicts in Syria, in Iraq, in Ukraine. Um, these conflicts, in my view, are, are perhaps giving rise to a, a very significant global health challenge. The issue of refugees, uh, the issue of low vaccination rates in, uh, in Iraq, Syria, and, and in Ukraine could lead, if we're not careful, to a serious global health issue. My organization, Rotary National, our global initiative is the eradication of polio. Uh, this region has been polio free for a long time. Ukraine has been polio free since 1996. However, with the conflicts, uh, there is a serious risk of polio reemerging. We had 35 cases in Syria last year. Fortunately, we just have one case this year. We have one case in Iraq. Uh, Ukraine is in grave danger of having a resurgence of polio. We've already had resurgences of measles, mumps, uh, pertussis, other uh, serious, uh, serious diseases. And so I think from a global health perspective, uh, the conflict in this region, conflict in Ukraine, uh, is giving rise to some very, very serious mm -hmm. concerns that we, civil society, government, uh, multilateral institutions, the business community, need to rally around. Thank you, Mr. Rago. Children are obviously one of the first targets, especially with health crisis. So what Rotary does is very important. I'd like to move to Mr. Haurami. You are in northern Iraq, so you are geographically, the proximity is very close to the ISIS threat happening. We know that the Kurds are fighting the ISIS threat, but it's a more of an imminent threat for you as well. Can you tell us some of the recent situation going on in your region? Uh, what are some of the challenges you're facing and uh, what are some of the expectations you have from the international community? Well, uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I think uh, we're taking the, the front or the, the burden of ISIS uh, aggression actually as a region. So the fight in Iraq particularly against our uh, region has been intense. We have something like 1,000 kilometers of front line with ISIS, which is bigger than any other border, actually. Uh, the situation is calm now. We, the initiative is with our Peshmerga, and we're taking control back 
from that initial aggression, thanks to international community and the support we receive from our neighbors, as well as, of course, from United States airstrikes. But I think in order to actually address this, one has to understand why ISIS, what is this phenomena? Uh, it just didn't just emerge. Uh, without analy analyzing the reasons for it, you cannot beat it. Uh, ISIS uh, was created as a resu result of failures of failed states in Syria and Iraq, actually. In, in a sense, the lack of or disenchanted communities in Iraq and Syria created fertile ground for extremism to mature. Compounded with that, they put their hands on a lot of modern weapons, which Iraqi army just ran away and surrendered it to them. That is why ISIS became bigger than perhaps initially like ordinary terrorist group. And really when you look back to that, it happened after Americans pulled out of Iraq, in our view it was a little bit prematurely. Iraq, yes, was equipped. The army was not fully mature to, to represent all Iraqis. It's a, so it became essentially a sectarian army, hmm. uh, only serving one part of the community against other communities. And that fed to more to the extremism. Uh, so essentially, despite of billions of dollars um, uh, spent on Iraqi army, Iraqi army was just like a pack of cards, collapsed and surrendered that. Uh, that uh, uh, resource to the hands of these terrorists, which they come from different parts of the, uh, the globe. Uh, in order to have an army can fight, it needs to actually have the back in its own people, not just one sector of the, the people. And the, fail, the failures in Iraq particularly, I'm sure that there are parallels in Syria. When people see sectarianism as being the basis of running the state, then the community, particularly in this case like Sunnis, despite the, the bad things that ISIS brought with them, they were still seen to be better than the guy in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. And that is basically why the sectarianism and fed into this uh, fertile ground actually to, to see the, uh, I hope it's not mine. No. It's not yours, <laughs> it's okay. <coughs> Uh, so, in, in order to actually beat um, ISIS, uh, in our view, there are three parameters here. There's a military, uh, economic, and political. You've got to work on all the fronts. Militarily, the terrorism doesn't have boundary. So, therefore, you can only beat him by not focusing on boundaries between Iraq and Syria. Say, I will fight in Iraq, but I don't fight in Syria. That is just deferring the problem, they come back. So you got to really have a strategy for the region. I was very pleased to hear that from President Erdogan, that we got to be looking at Iraq, Syria as a package yeah. in order to actually uh, uh, solve this problem uh, per permanently. So that's on the military side. Um, yes, airstrikes have been effective, but airstrikes do not actually boot out all of these people from homes and streets. So you need boots on the ground. How you do that, you need to have uh, strong cooperation locally. Uh, our Peshmergas are ready for that. Iraqi army hopefully will be partially ready for that. But you also need the international community and I think Turkish role is crucial in this case as a geopolitical power to come in <coughs> and coordinate with international, uh, let's say, sponsors, providers to actually make sure that we have a milita effective military action against uh, this group, both in Iraq as well as in Syria. And of course, without economic backing, organizations like that cannot continue. So they have some access to funds, needs to be cut out. And now actually within Syria and Iraq, they also have access to some oil. Uh, in Iraq, there are one, two fields are in their hands in Hamrin and Ajib. Mm -hmm. In Syria, one, two, three fields are actually in the Sunni areas that are in their hands. So what we have to do there is actually make sure that oil does not get to the market and they cannot monetize it. And uh, it's hard when you have 1,000 kilometers this way, 1,000 kilometers that way. So mm -hmm. it needs a coordination on intelligence and on actually um, uh, determination to actually beat that. In Kurdistan, we've been fighting hard uh, on that. We actually have set up a security and uh, from the energy cooperation mm -hmm. on that. I'm going to ask you about that actually in the second round, to more details, because sure. I think there's an interesting story there. 
Uh, let me move to Mr. Zapsu. Uh, Mr. Zapsu, the Turkish government has long been saying, has been warning about the Maliki administration. I was saying that the Sunnis in Iraq were being isolated for a long time. They also called for international action on Syria for a long time. Uh, that came very late. So do you feel sometimes that the international community was very late to intervene in this region? How do you take that guidance? How did these things come to the point they did? I'm not a politician anymore, I'm a businessman, I can be a bit, bit blunter than anybody else here and I feel quite sick when I hear uh, the whole issue uh, just about a so-called Islamic Caliphate or, or uh, other splitter groups, it has much bigger roots, the whole issue here. And, um, and when I listen to the discussion with ISIS and hear, oh, we have to kill the leaders and whatever, I, th I think, hey, I mean, nobody learns anything, I think, because if we just kill the leaders and then they think it's done, another bad guy will come, because that's not the problem. It is much, much bigger roots. It has much bigger roots. Of course, the Turkish, you asked about, the, uh, about uh, Turkey's uh, alone left, left alone struggle in Syria. Uh, you cannot only go against ISIS. ISIS just is, a, is coming up from the uh, not accepting, not understanding of the Arab Spring. The MENA region population for the first time in centuries in history, actually, uh, just voted democratically, thought, Okay, these are freedoms and stuff. And then, you know what happened? The West, the so-called West, didn't understand what's going on. They didn't understand that, uh, for an example, uh, the Ikhwan could suppress these uh, splitter groups like ISIS, like others. And I always told my business friends, hey, the next step is not the liberals. The next steps are the Salafis. And so it came out. And therefore, I think, I think everybody should understand, we have to look at this as, where are the roots? OK, what happens if we get rid of ISIS? What happens with the Bashar? What about, do we, do we have Syria uh, issues solved if we get rid of ISIS? Don't we have to get rid of also of the bloody dictatorship? And what about after Syria? Is that it? I believe everybody should think, where is the root of the story? And we have to. We have to come up. It is the Palestine issue. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go into that in the following rounds as well. Let me turn to Mr. Ms. Felder. I want to take the European angle in all of this. Obviously, the ISIS threat is going to have uh, spillover effects in Europe. There are a lot of ISIS fighters with European passports, and there is an increasing concern in Europe that they would go back and travel freely within the European continent, which will bring with it uh, a hard time for the Muslims uh, living in Europe, mm -hmm. because all, most of the Muslims live in Europe face being profiled uh, as possible militants. So are you uh, concerned at all about any spillover effects, one? And second, uh, any racial profiling on the Muslims? Like, would the Muslims have a democratically OK life in Europe? Um, I, I don't know how it is in other uh, countries. I'm, of course, in other European countries, I can speak for Germany. It is, I'm, of course, concerned when I see uh, the debate in the UK about migration, for example, or in France. In Germany, we haven't had these in the quite, um, not in the last uh, few months. Um, that might change, but um, thanks to the Turkish authorities and thanks to the uh, Kurds, we um, got a lot of help to protect ourselves in the last couple of weeks. If you might have read it, there was a plot um, planned by German passport holders coming back from um, Daesh 
uh, ISIS uh, planning something against uh, the European Commission. There was another plot uh, last week which was prohibited thanks to the cooperation with the Kurdish um, secret uh, service with the Turks, uh, Turkish authorities and I think this is something where we have to be very careful in telling the public everything about these things in, on, on the press but I, uh, me and other parliamentarians, we um, um, asked our, the head of the German security services uh, that they should um, uh, tell the public about um, the cooperation because, because right now you see many rumors and many uh, negative reports about the role of Turkey and I appreciate very much what President Erdogan has said yesterday and the truth as well is, and Dr. Ashti you might agree, um, the, without the uh, good cooperation among the Kurdish uh, regional government and uh, Erdogan's uh, people here in, in, Istan in Ankara and Istanbul, uh, Kurdistan would have been blown up a uh, long time ago. So I believe this cooperation is vital and this is something Germany and especially the European Union should support more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sayın Bakan, bugünkü geldiğimiz noktaya bakarken bizden büyük resmi çizmenizi rica ediyorum. That usually uh, find themselves in uh, Arab prisons. I mean, these organizations weren't created overnight. Turkey has been talking about the isolation of Sunnis in the Maliki government. Uh, Turkey has been asking for some action in Syria, and now we see that there's belated action. Where do you see where we stand? Well, today. The situation we see is no surprise for people who have been following the developments. In the second half of the previous century, and especially in the past quarter of the previous century, we have had a communication revolution. We see a phenomenon that's generally called globalization. However, this has some results, some outputs, and I think that the world at large isn't really analyzing these results in as much detail as it should. There are significant technological developments, and we have not yet created a civilization framework for these developments. Look at these regions. There are examples from different regions. There are specific examples from throughout the world. But here we are focusing specifically on the Middle East. Let's, let's look at the Middle East. We have some closed regimes there, and thanks to the communication evolution, the young people, the young people now have direct as access to developments around the world. These authoritarian or despotic regimes are unable to create political or economic answers to the political and economic demands of the young people. So. In these countries, the population is also increasing because in compared to other sectors, the developments in the health sector reach these countries more than they do in other sectors. For example, in all of these countries, we see that the life expectancy is increasing in almost all of these countries. So all of these factors come together to create a young population that's increasing in number almost on a daily basis. They have specific political objections and political demands. They're learning more and more about the world. They learn about the world in greater detail. They have new demands, and these regimes no longer meet the demands of the young people. And these regimes are despotic authoritarian regimes. And many young people feel that it's the developed world that supports these authoritarian regimes. The young people feel that the people that live in these countries do not support these regimes. So the young people assume that it's the big powers, it's the big countries, the developed countries that support these authoritarian regimes. I am making this as a general comment. I'm not going to go into specific countries. 
Because of this perception, there is serious reaction against developed countries as well as against the authoritarian regimes in these countries. However, there are conventional arms and there are large uh, projects in these countries. However, these reactions grow stronger and stronger and these young people try to find solutions. The developing or underdeveloped countries in the region have problems about terrorism. They have an environment where many people overreact or where people create or where people have extreme reactions. So the people end up manifesting their reactions. They do their best to express their objections. And of course, uh, everybody has access to the internet, everyone has TVs, everyone has mobile phones. So many cultures are interacting with each other. In the Western world, we see excessive individualization. And this excessive individualization causes people to be, I don't know, somewhat more egocentric, or they are indifferent to other policies around the world. In other words, they don't necessarily think about what the repercussions of their steps may be. So when the young people in the region look at the Western world, that is the kind of uh, cultural atmosphere that they see. Obviously, you always have exceptions to the rule. I'm making some general comments here. So we are talking about, uh, in a way, a clash of civilizations. In the Western world, nothing is sacred. But in the Eastern world, what is not sacred is not valuable. So that's part of the problem, too. So these young people want to find a solution to their problems. So Arab Spring was, in fact, the peak of these developments. We saw a wave that grew larger and larger. And if we had been able to use this wave to create a democratic structure in these countries, then we would not have had these terrorism problems. Terrorism is a threat against all of us, including the Western world. So Western regimes or strong countries, I think, were hesitant to take the initiative. They were quite late in correctly interpreting the developments in the region. So unfortunately, if we adapt a conformist approach, we can say that maybe the whole world will not be on fire, but I think that we will all uh, see the results of the fire. The world is shrinking, but the problems are not shrinking. The problems in one country have repercussions that affect even the remotest countries around the world. So you see the developments around the world. These young people get organized. They want to express their reactions. This is not sustainable at this day and age. Each period, each era creates its own regime, creates its own social structure. So in these post-industrial countries, democracy is not an option, it's not an alternative, but it's absolutely mandatory. It's a must. The people who interact with life on a daily basis, people who are part of the society. And these people need to be presented with solutions created by the system. Unless you find a solution, then this will translate into a problem for the society. So the, this is the root of the problems that we see around this, around this region. I don't want to take much of your time, but there are solutions. Uh, the solutions are quite obvious to all, but I'm worried that we're going to run late. We will be elaborating on uh, possible solutions. The national has been very active in uh, conflict resolution as well. Uh, conflict resolution and peace are one of the pillars of Rotary. When we look at the region, it's not just Iraq and Syria. You also look at Palestine. There was recently a war where over 100 United Nations schools and hospitals were damaged and over 2,000 Palestinians died, of which 500 were children. This region, there is also 
obviously growing crisis in Ukraine and Russia. So the region is as unstable as ever. Do you think the international community is doing its share? I mean, there are state actors and non-state actors, but what could be done on, on a concrete level to bring some stability, if not a resolution of the conflicts, a management of the conflicts? Again, as I mentioned in my earlier intervention, we do have uh, in this area in Ukraine really a significant brewing uh, health challenge, particularly in the area of communicable diseases. Secondly, how do we deal with the challenges that this region, Ukraine, face? And how do we address some of the issues that the minister just outlined, youth, clash of civilizations, as he, as he called it? It seems to me that the ultimate solution has to be a multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder uh, solution. And here, I think civil society can play an extremely uh, important role in addressing some of the, the challenges, the long-term challenges that we face. Obviously, civil society can't address the geopolitical the military issues that we face, but certainly in the long term, some of the social issues. What does civil society bring to the table? It brings, first of all, advocacy, a voice for those that are not able to express their voice. It provides a collective voice uh, to society, for society to express its concerns. It acts as a watchdog. A watchdog keeps government honest, keeps business honest. Uh, again, acts as a watchdog. Uh, third, it takes action. It takes significant action, very often bridges the gap between what government can offer and what society, society needs. Um, at an earlier panel uh, yesterday, uh, considerable discussion about trust. What institutions in society have the most trust? Uh, number one, civil society. The lowest by far was government. Media was not far uh, behind soon, unfortunately. <coughs> so I think civil society can play an incredibly important role in addressing some of these challenges. Uh, take my organization, Rotary International. Part of the solution to dealing with the issues the minister raised is to break down barriers between people. So we, for example, run uh, a huge student exchange program. We send 9,000 students uh, around the world for different countries to spend mm -hmm. a year uh, studying and living in another culture. When people interact in that way. You break down some of these barriers. You break down some of the cultural barriers, and you lead to long-term understanding. I solutions. just want to inform the audience, maybe they're not aware of it, but Mr. Hefkos, one of his earlier roles has been the uh, vice president in the Millennium uh, Project, uh, which was a project by the Bush administration. He was responsible for distributing aid up to $6.3 billion over the course of five years. So he took an active role in the distribution of his aid. So when you look at especially these conflict areas, do you think enough aid is coming in. I mean, Turkey is sitting with a million and a half refugees at this border, but uh, you were very active in distributing aid. So do you think enough is coming? No, I don't think enough is coming. And I think in general, we need to rethink, uh, the world needs to rethink the way in which foreign assistance and development assistance is, is given to uh, countries. Very often, the assistance is given for the wrong reasons. We need development assistance, in my view, one, to deal with the humanitarian immediate crises that, that arise but more fundamentally, to use development assistance to lay the groundwork for thriving, prosperous economies. Thriving countries tend not to have the problems that the minister was alluding to, uh, yes. to earlier. So I think, and I would urge the world, we need a significant rethink in the way in which foreign assistance is developed, organized, and implemented uh, around the world, targeted toward laying the groundwork for prosperous, market-driven solutions sustainable jobs, economies that work. Mm -hmm. Mr. Harami, let me move on to you. Financial Times recently uh, published an article saying that uh, ISIS <coughs> had uh, daily earnings up to $5 million. It was a, a number between three to $5 million, and that now they are able to produce 500 uh, barrels of oil a day. It was no surprise that U.S. targeted oil refineries in the region. Let's get the situation in the ground from you. First of all, did the airstrikes help, uh, especially the strikes on the, uh, some of the ISIS threats, but also on the um, refineries? And second, what is their revenue situation? Are they continuing to get that uh, money? Well, let me, let me just address uh, the basic issue in Kurdistan and then how how that fits into that, uh, the overall picture. Within the region, we face in three huge crises. One, of course, the fight against ISIS, mm -hmm. it's military and 
we've got to sustain that. These people have not been fully beaten. They are there. They got a lot of support. They, they are still fighting with us. Second, we have a flood of refugees, which is unparalleled in the world. I mean, yesterday uh, we heard from President Erdogan how difficult it has been for Turkey to cope in with one and a half million refugee in, in refugees in uh, your country. And that is a huge state with 70, 80 million population. We are only 5 million population. We have 1.5, 1.6 million refugees. Some 250, 300 thousand are from Syria. Some are from the local areas like Yazidis, the minority religions, Christians, uh, Shabaks, and all of those. Some are Arabs who have been displaced by running away from ISIS. These people, for example, in Duhok, which is border in Turkey, population of Duhok roughly is about a million people. We have about 800,000 refugees in the city. It's actually swollen double. Overnight, double size. We have 600 um, schools, or 600, whatever the number is, 1,000 or something schools. Some 90% of those are occupied by the refugees. So actually, the infrastructure is destroyed. Our people now, children, cannot go back to school. Uh, we have a lot of energy issues, a lot of financial crisis. And on top of that, we've been punished by our own government to Ways. One, they look at refugee crisis in <coughs> Kurdistan as if it is another country. We're not getting any help from Baghdad. People don't look at it. It's just, oh, well, there's a Kurdish problem. They can cope with it. Secondly, as a good measure for punishment, they cut our budget from beginning of the year till now. So we, on one hand, I, uh, we have Peshmerga fighting on the front. I can't pay their wages. And we're still looking at July salary not being paid. Mm. How can you motivate the guy that has to fight on the front line? We have our own government, despite actually changing the government, is still thinking about sending us money. Mm. How can you actually sustain this punishment in Kurdistan to actually, <coughs> these are the crises. So we have to manage these big, big crises. And ISIS come back to it. I mentioned earlier, one leg of their strength is economic. We have to destroy that. And of course, access to oil creates revenue. They have it in, nothing in Kurdistan under their control. They have under their control in Sydney Syria area when two field, fields are refer, referred to, and in Syria. I'm glad that Americans and others with airstrikes hitting top in plans, infrastructure to deprive them from that. But that is not enough. They need intelligence and security on the ground so everybody is aware to stop. For example, yesterday, I was delighted I had a call from my Minister of uh, Interior Office. We caught yet again another four tankers crossing the border towards Kirkuk. We got those, and there were seven uh, drivers there. They were all from Ramadi, Mosul, Fallujah, mm -hmm. uh, transporting this crude, and we caught them. They are actually now in the hands of uh, security forces. Um, a week ago, we had 12 tankers. So we're doing our best to do that, but we can't do it alone without intelligence because we're supposed to get the intelligence when he moves from the field. They get 500 kilometers, let's catch him there before he arrives at our border. Mm -hmm. And likewise, uh, it's not just our border is open, the border to all the other neighbors is open, whether it goes towards Syria, towards uh, Jordan, towards uh, Turkey. To we go to all gather information to actually destroy this. And we are determined as a, as a region not to allow. We don't need ISIS oil. We have plenty of it. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it is a headache for us. We don't allow it. And I actually say here as a minister, if anyone give me intelligence, a single topping plan or a single tanker crossing a border from Iraq or Syria to our region, bring in the information, see how we deal with it. Mm -hmm. So uh, cheap propaganda or information about this particular report are read, the respectable uh, newspaper. But actually, when you read it, it's just a story. It doesn't have information about who said it. Where did they get the information? Show me a picture. Give me some information about the tanker so I can actually go and prosecute these people and catch them. So a reporter needs to, under the sensitive information, provide genuine information so we can actually all benefit from it. But I say again, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. For sure, it is, uh, when you have oil, is always an opportunity for somebody making money. And if you are a terrorist, it's even the best thing you should try. 
<laughs> but therefore, the intelligent gathering between Turkey, uh, people engaged in Kurdistan now fighting ISIS, like Americans and European allies, give us the information. Let us give you the information. So just as we chasing a tanker moving towards Kurdistan and they hit it, let us also uh, find the you know a, a supplier of crude mm -hmm. or product whatever moving towards any border, hit it there. So that when you actually got rid of few of them, basically people will be deterred yeah. to, to carry out this. You seem very confident of your stance there <coughs> and very transparent. Let me move on to Mr. Zapso. Um, Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel uh, gave a briefing in Pentagon and when you looked at the context of the briefing, the possibility of a no-fly zone or a buffer zone, as we expect in Turkey, was not in part of the works there. Uh, the situation at the border is getting really dangerous, and obviously a no-fly zone would help. What do you think is deterring U.S.? Do you think the U.S. is reluctant because a no-fly zone would mean that they have to take down Assad's... Uh, air defense system, is that what they don't want to get involved in? What is making them hesitant there? Okay, I don't like conspiracy stories, but there are a few U.S. because you said just, what do you think U.S.? There are so many different U.S.'s. And uh, I believe that the administration right now is back to their senses and they understand what's really going on there. And that you cannot go, like the British just said, just in Iraq against ISIS. Or you cannot go only against ISIS, actually. As, as far as I tried to explain, there are three main issues right now which has to be solved. Uh, this is Syria. This is the story between Baghdad and Erbil. It has to be solved. It can't go like that. Like the minister just said, I mean, you cannot act totally ignorant on one side and then say no to the other side, to the financial issues. And in Syria, as I said, there, it's not only ISIS or, or other groups, Al-Qaeda's or whatever's. Uh, there has to be a, a, a chosen government again in Syria. But that's not all. I tried to explain. Uh, uh, there's another issue, which is uh, the in phrase could be mother of the stories. And this is Palestine, for God's sake. How can it be that a single Western life, you know, cut the throat thing, can be, has more uh, importance, more value, than thousands, thousands of children dying for years? Nobody did care for nothing. Right now, okay, people are talking about ISIS. It's not it. These things, I mean, in my point of view, I'm just a little businessman, I, I'm not a big politician, but hey, we have to tackle the Palestinian issue. And it's not Palestine. It's not Hamas. It is Israel itself who can solve it. Only Israel. Three questions they have to understand. I mean, the leadership of Israel. Are we a Jewish state? Are we a democratic state? Do we want to retrieve from the West Bank? You cannot have all three. Because if you are a Jewish state, you cannot get the West Bank because then you're an apartheid. So this has, that's the whole package. Today, when you just, okay, polio, this, that, hey, a dead people, they don't need aid. They are dead. They don't need any medication or something. People are dying right now. And what you do like now with bombing and this and that, that's just, just uh, you know, putting some maybe some drops of eau de Cologne. I don't want to go too much into that, but I, I believe that people do understand what I tried to say. And the U.S., the administration at least, as I said, there are a lot of different faces of the U.S. The administration, in the end, did come to the census. They do really know. By the way, we're not talking about a buffer zone. We're talking about a of course, our minister will tell you much uh, more what we're talking about. But what I understand, it's not a buffer zone. It's a no-fly zone. And we need that. We have one and a half million people here. And I don't want to know, as a businessman, as a Turkish taxpayer, how much we're paying. I really don't want to know, because otherwise I would have some ethical questions myself. But I would like to know what the others are helping. 
but the US or the West is uh, helping uh, in this situation with this one and a half million. Thank you, Mr. Zab. So uh, I'm going to move on to Mr. Ms. Felder. Uh, I was planning to talk more about ISIS, but the time is limited, so I also wanted to bring as part of our agenda Ukraine into the table as well. Obviously, there's a growing crisis there in Ukraine. It's more of a, a face-off between NATO and Russia, it seems. When you look at it from Russian perspective, the Russians would tell you that NATO provoked them and that Crimea was, uh, could have been the next naval base of NATO. There are people in Russia, this, there was a foreign policy article about this as well, they felt intimidated that NATO was going into the borders of Russia. When you ask the Europeans, they say, oh, Russia is a big threat, you know, Eastern Europe is on threat. So both sides have their sides to the argument. How do you see, I mean, Germany sits at the leadership of Europe. They're like the engine of growth for Europe. Uh, how do you see when you look at it from both sides? Yeah, first of all, you always have to consider that um, Germany by far is the strongest um, a country in the European Union on economic terms, but not necessarily on, foreign policy, on the foreign policy agenda because we are not nuclear power, we are not part of the United Nations Security Council, and the truth is as, uh, as well that most of the Germans would prefer to be like Switzerland mm. than to be engaged. And um, this is, uh, you, can, you can ask the people on the street how they feel about this issue. They are still suffering from the Afghanistan mission and uh, for sure they won't, won't, uh, don't want to become part of a conflict in Syria and of course not with Russia. Uh, because this is um, it extremely, uh, it's deep in our society. We don't want to have this conf direct confrontation with Russia, not among NATO and, uh, and Russia, but unfortunately you see that uh, there's a lot of irrational uh, developments uh, during the past 12 months has happened, uh, which were surprising. Because even, I think even President Putin would have never expected that this conflict between the West and Russia is going so far. Um, he will, wanted to show that Russia has changed, that Russia is an open-minded country. They invested so much money in Sochi. They released Khodorkovsky. Uh, they wanted to be um, a friend, seen as a friendly country. And um, that has failed completely. So, um, and, in, and, up, and on both sides, there's a lot of irrationality on both sides. So, uh, do you what think I, the pardon? sanctions on the oligarchs um, would work? That's a new strategy. They've never done that. I don't now think that the oligarchs have uh, any kind of power in, in Moscow. It's Putin that calls the shots. A pun? It's Putin that calls the shots. No, it's not only Putin. You might know that there are another people, uh, there's a group around Putin and many um, powerful people in this country. Um, I, don't, I don't think that uh, we should try to escalate the situation. Mm -hmm. I think we should try to find a um, uh, strategic approach. Um, maybe we have uh, made progress on, on Friday evening among the European Commission negotiations uh, with uh, Ukraine and, and Russia on the gas deal. If this is going to work, maybe um, gas should be the, not the reason for a next conflict. Maybe gas is the trigger for a political solution because everything which was negotiated among President Poroshenko and President Putin so far was not as successful as all of us hoped. But um, the gas um, issue is becoming, from my point of view, uh, could become a trigger for a better development and then we should uh, try to find also a solution which is sustainable on the political side. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Sayin Bakan, in a burge, don't make it. Coming back to the region, distinguished minister, in the European press, from time to time, European countries, uh, when they receive 200, uh, 300 refugees, they have big headlines. We ex uh, accepted this, these many refugees. Well, look at Turkey. We, at present, have already received, welcomed, uh, one and a half million, maybe more than one and a half million refugees, and uh, they are uh, welcome and received uh, in uh, refugee camps uh, with uh, great conditions. Turkey has a demand. Turkey uh, would like to have uh, a no-fly zone. Uh, so what uh, do we, as Turkey, expect from the international community? With your permission, we had expectations 
we will we are having expectations and we will have expectations what was one of the expectations as i mentioned as a continuum uh, to what i said the assad regime killed uh, 250,000 people millions of people are affected injured and they don't have any possibility to be cured treated uh, we should have intervened from the very beginning. This was not the case. And uh, under these circumstances, in this environment, well, uh, the reasoning doesn't change the consequences. Well, terrorist organizations appeared uh, which resort to terrorism as a method. We are condemning here uh, the state terror of Assad and also the uh, and also the uh, terrorist organizations uh, which emerged in Iraq as a result of the oppressive regime of Maliki. All these came together, and we are experiencing a humanitarian tragedy. Well, at this stage. We are expecting the following intervention. Now that we have this situation, we have to establish a no-fly zone in the southern border of Turkey, which will be a secure zone. Because at present, we have more than one and a half million refugees, and we don't, we didn't receive any uh, international aid. We have spent uh, up till now uh, 400 million, more than 400 billion US dollars. Uh, last week, uh, in seven days, we received one, more than 150,000 more refugees, which is the population of a town. International organizations don't contribute. You spent 4 billion US dollars. Uh, the United Nations contributed 150 million US dollars, a total of 240 million US dollars of international aid out of 4 billion US dollars of expenses incurred by Turkey. There are certain military issues which need to be uh, discussed, of course, uh, take whether to take or not to take initiative, etc. What is the obstacle to developed countries uh, in providing and extending aid. Why don't they take initiative in extending aid, international aid? So these hesitations uh, just uh, create uh, even further frustrations in the eyes of people. What we want here is, without further delay, uh, that the world act together the United Nations, under the auspices of uh, the United Nations, uh, international aid can be extended to those refugees uh, seeking refuge in uh, foreign countries. A mechanism has to be set for uh, such international aid to be extended uh, to refugees. What else can be done? These people, um, the refugees, are living uh, in these areas. And we have to assume a political um, attitude which could be welcomed by these people, uh, uh, an attitude against uh, Assad, for example. Well, uh, these uh, 1.5 million refugees uh, have fled uh, into Turkey from Syria, and they share the same religion, even uh, other refugees, these uh, people all suffer. If you do not take uh, their frustrations, I'm afraid uh, we will see further terrorist organizations and individual terrorists will be replacing organized terrorist crimes. I'm quite concerned about this possibility. So why do I say that? Well, uh, there are many people, warriors, uh, joining Ushid, uh, the, uh, excuse me, ISIL, uh, around 150 countries. Uh, the citizens of around 150 countries provided warriors, uh, militants, uh, to ISIL. And uh, we have 
uh, introduced a ban for the travel of uh, more than 1,000 people. And uh, around 1,000 people uh, were also deported uh, from Turkey. Well, where do we head? We have to uh, see it. Developed countries, rich countries, political blocs are heading a certain uh, destination. But what about the rest? We have to consider the rest of the world if we want to establish universal peace if we uh, seek universal peace, uh, because uh, no politics would be uh, useful, let alone uh, promoting democracy or maximizing profits, uh, etc. Well, we are seeking a minimum universal peace. What, uh, how to realize? By ensuring internal peace in individuals, you can establish universal peace. That is why we are seeking uh, justice. Why are we just keep watching what is going on in Gaza? Well, uh, is it a problem which cannot be solved by humanity as a whole? OK, the Assad regime is a despotic regime. 250,000 people were killed. Can't we take initiative against this? Is it a huge uh, problem, and like a natural disaster, which we cannot tackle? What is this that we cannot act? So very easily, uh, when we become reasonable and when we take political initiative in line with uh, humanity, uh, well, these problems, since we don't do that, uh, such problems which cannot be resolved very easily in the beginning uh, become huge problems uh, where we devise military action. So specifically to your question, let me underline my answer. We need to take immediate action. We need to specifically focus on the border between Turkey and Syria. So we must establish a no-fly zone within the Syrian border. Of course, you need to have the right definition as to what it should involve. The coalition should take the initiative to solve this human crisis. Thank you, Mr. Minister. And the format we follow here, I'll now open the floor to questions. If any member of our audience has any questions to our speakers, let me start with the lady over there. Please state your name and the organization you belong as well. Hümeyra uh, Pamuk, Reuters Haber Ajansı. I can ask in English. Yes. My, yes. my question is to the minister, though. O zaman Türkçe buyurun. Türkçe, sorry. Efendim, e, demin Sir, would you please clarify some of the numbers you quoted? You quoted some numbers about ISIS. Are these the, you talked about 100, 1,010 people from 73 companies who were deported, who were expatriated. What's the timeline for that? Were these people specifically ISIS-related people, or were they people involved in terrorism in general? That's my first question. Let me move on to my second question. The, the tanks are ready and set to go on the Turkish border. And over the weekend, uh, Kurds in Turkey went to Kobani. 1,500 Kurdish fighters went to Kobani based on some information in the media. Do you know exactly the, the number? Let me start with your second question. That uh, uh, information is not correct. If you know about this region, you will know that there is a railway between Kobani and Suruç. There is merely a bridge between the two towns. I correct myself, says the minister. There is a border there. These two towns are very close to each other. It's impossible for these people to go to Kobani. No, that's not at all the case. Let's say I said 73 countries, 1,010 people. These are foreign fighters in Syria. They are people who have come to the Turkish border and we uh, sent them back to their own countries. We repatriated them. We worked in cooperation with people 
Turkey also put a travel ban on 6,615 people from 81 countries. These are individuals who have not come to Turkey yet, but should they attempt to do so, they will not be taken into our borders. So, in our region, we've had some recent developments in Syria. We had ISIS, and before then we had Nusra. So these are the, the figures I cited are the figures pertaining to the last the past year. Before then, there weren't, uh, ref uh, there weren't any cases of foreign fighters going to the region, no. So uh, the, the figure I give is since we've had foreign fighters going into the region. I can't give you a specific date, but I will say this is the total number. I have a question to Mr. Minister. Yesterday, Mr. President said that four and a half billion dollars have been spent, and you yourself said that 150 million was the figure that was given in the form of aid. Yes, that's the UN figure. Right, the UN figure. Now, here's what I don't understand. The Western countries are not helping at all. How about Saudi Arabia, Qatar, or the UAE, Dubai, Malaysia? How about these countries? They are countries that have significant resources. How come these countries are not offering any aid? Um, I ask my second question as a citizen of Turkey. Morally, it's correct to open our doors to these people. However, at least some of some of these people pose a security problem. In Karaköy, we've seen these poor, poor people out in the streets. They're begging for food. They're trying to wipe car windows, and some of them are engaged in what I may call unpleasant incidences. So how do you see this problem from an internal security problem? What are the internal security related measures that were taken? The UN gave $160 million, uh, and uh, the number is up to what? The total number is up to $244 million. So the difference of 80 million comes from Saudi Arabia and a number of Arab countries. I don't want to give you a breakdown of all the countries. So there is some form of aid. However, this is not significant aid. This aid is far from significant. Sometimes international organizations' representatives uh, come uh, to Turkey and they say, can we take 500 people? Can we take 1,000 people? Can we take 30 people? That's not the way to approach this issue. This is not the correct attitude. You can't take such a significant issue so lightly. So let me restate this back in this platform. Let's turn into security. Uh, let's turn back to security issues. We think about these issues from the perspective of a social capacity. Let's accept the fact that we have an historical responsibility, and the Turkish people are aware of this too. In, under other circumstances, no country would have taken so many people. And we, uh, Turkey is not a country where the per cap income is $50,000. No, it's only 11000 And uh, Turkey is, has accepted so many people, and it's offering them the best opportunities it can. Turkey has a historical background about this issue, and Turkey is conscientious from a historical and cultural perspective. Such concerns may be irrelevant for certain countries, but they are definitely very relevant for Turkey. So, let me make a specific comment in response to your question. Statistics show that our guests from Syria are hardly involved in any crime. Their crime rates are very low at this point. However, this does not guarantee anything for the future, of course. We are doing some work on this, but as you yourself are able to observe, although there may be some unpleasant incidences, when you look at one and a half million people in total, and when you look at the crime rates throughout the country, we see that there is uh, no reason to worry at this point. In other words, the crime rate among these people is lower than the crime rate in the general public. 
Thank you, Mr. Minister. So you're saying we will act as hospitable Turks? Yes, I am saying that. However, I am saying that developed countries should act as developed countries. I'm making an official uh, a call to these countries. Uh, my name is Sharif al Ramrawi from Egypt. Uh, as we talk about the, uh, the uh, civil society, um, actually, we are all aiming to keep them in good conditions. And all the revolutions came from the civil society. And also some of the problems, like extremists, terrorism, and so on, also came from the civil society. <clears throat> so I'm asking now the panelists. I mean, we have politicians, we have parliamentarians, we have businessmen. So what, in your opinion, could be done from your side to support the civil society represented in NGOs and other organizations to play their real role? as the gap between the civil society and the governments in our area is really huge. So we need organizations to translate the ideas, the needs of the civil society to the governments so things could uh, go on. I'll direct that question to Mr. Hefcock, since he's the Secretary General of Rotary International. Just a clarification of terms, I'm not sure any extremism comes from civil society, maybe from non-state actors, we get a lot of extremism, but how do you define civil society, just to develop on that question, and do you think extremism comes from there? I mean, a civil society, as I, as I mentioned earlier, takes a number of forms and is active in a number of different spaces. There's the civil society that advocates for a particular issue. There's civil society that actually takes direct action, offers social services and, and benefits to, uh, to society. But yes, I do think in this region the gap is, is, quite, uh, is quite large, and I think it's imperative on the, and I would turn to the panelists that are, that are in government, that it's absolutely imperative to for governments to create the conditions to allow civil society to, to prosper. Because in many ways, the state of civil society is a barometer on, on issues such as freedom of association, freedom of expression. Uh, and if civil society is being obviously oppressed and not able to flourish, then obviously it's a symbol of, of what's uh, not happening well in, in, in society. But again, what we need is a multi-stakeholder solution to many of these uh, problems. Uh, they're long-term problems. And to the gentleman's question, civil society needs and has to play an incredibly important role. But that gap is huge in this part of the world. It needs to be um, shortened. And I would turn to perhaps the minister to get his thoughts on, 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 on what can government do to, to, to shrink that gap. Uh, well, Of course, a civil society needs an open society. In other words, you need to have an open society, a democratic regime, in order to have a civil society. If you have an anti-democratic authoritarian regime, you can't really have civil society in the real sense of the world. Such an organization would not be a civil society organization. Such a society would simply be another organization that tries to get its point across to the state. So let's be clear about that. You need to have the right environment to have civil society. States or let me put it this way. It's important that uh, states and civil society work together in overcoming some of the challenges that we're faced with. It's vital to have such cooperation. However, there are some civil society organizations, there are some civil organizations that become sectors in their own in some very developed countries. In other words, civil society organizations start uh, getting engaged in PR activities more than in aid activities. That's another problem. Then we have extremism and marginalization. There may be cases of marginalization. The success of democratic societies leave uh, rest in keeping marginals as extremist organizations. They need to keep these individuals from becoming uh, terrorist organizations. 
if a society or if a state is able to keep these ideas as marginal ideas rather than as uh, destructive ideas, then that's a sign of success. Because if you can't keep these marginal ideas as marginal ideas only, then these organizations may end up using terrorism. Democratic societies mean that there's less support for support. So very extreme ideas are unable to find social support, so they no longer become terrorist organizations. I'm not saying that there are no exceptions to the rule, but generally speaking, uh, this is the kind of structure we seem to be seeing. Uh, lady over there. Can I have a microphone to turn it on? Um, thank you very much. My name is Metap Tari. I'm an independent legal advisor for some governments. Um, actually, um, I would like to ask a question in general to this distinguished panel. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what is missing personally, uh, what is missing in the, that crisis period is um, we, are, we don't have the instruments, necessary instruments for the international public law to intervene, to get uh, different powers together and to, to propose some solutions. As uh, His Excellency Mr. Harami mentioned, uh, like Kurdistan uh, regional government feels alone because uh, the, the, the problem he's having with the central government of Iraq cannot be solved in the international area. Whereas in the international area, we don't have any legal propose, proposal to, to help the governments, mm -hmm. uh, like Kurdistan regional governments. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know uh, what are the efforts, efforts that they are preparing, or are they preparing anything, any new solutions for the international public law mm -hmm. to, to support these governments actually, regional or, or central governments. Mm -hmm. And um, secondly, I would like to know also how we distinguish where, where we say the intervention uh, must be more than Iraq but also Syria. Uh, how, how we decide in Syria to who support. I mean, even we, we, we don't like Assad, this is the regime which is on, on standing there still. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is no discipline between the oppositions. So how, how do we support this uh, two, Thank you. two parties? Thank you. Because of limitation of time, I'm going to divert to your first question about the lack of legal uh, structure there to Mr. Um, Ms. Felder. Uh, developing on that, you look at EU, you've just said it. It's not even a common force as a foreign policy. NATO doesn't seem to be much. We see in Ukraine, they're left in their own. Uh, as Europe, they cannot do anything. There's not a European peace force that we see in Middle East. So rightly so, what she points out is, what are some of the legal frameworks that could be done? And the second part of your question to Mr. Harami, uh, who do we know what to support, who to support in Syria? How do we differentiate that? It's a very complex situation. Please go ahead. I'm happy that the, Dr. Ashley gets the second question. Yes. I was... Um, <laughs> You have the geographical uh, advantage in that. Yes, always. Yeah. And my, um, I, I guess the, uh, the legal framework is not, so, it's not so bad because, for one example, if we're talking about uh, Kurdistan, there is a uh, right of self-determination de for, for the people. Um, but it's a problem of the, um, uh, just in case, if um, President Masoud Barzani would call for a referendum, there would be a legal way to, uh, to protect their rights. The question is, who is guaranteeing, uh, who gives a guarantee today in our times um, of, that this law is, uh, yeah, is, is forced to be in place? Uh, is it uh, America any longer? I, I doubt it because America right now is doing, from my point of view, a um, mistake because they, they are carrying this dead body of the one Iraq policy um, still and are convinced that this is uh, the right way. I'm not. Um, but Turkey uh, is um, Turkey is a regional power who, who is in the lead and which I said at the beginning protected uh, Kurdistan and helped them a lot. Um, but um, are we backing Turkey enough from the European perspective? We just discussed it earlier before the session uh, began. It's a question of the um, geopolitical need for, for Europe to solve uh, the, um, the relation, the problems in the relations among the European Union and Turkey. Because, because if we don't have this topic solved, we cannot play this role, this active role in the Middle East, what we should do. Mm -hmm. Mr. Havrami, just to reiterate on the question, 
if we support uh, a fight against ISIS, are we making Nusra stronger? Or are we making Assad regime stronger? How do we know who to support, who to fight, and when to do it? Well, I would like, you know, I, mean, I used to see myself as a technocrat. I'm sitting in the most politicized <laughs> system here. <laughs> but, uh, I warned his advisors before, so he knew he was coming into the battle. Right. Um, I think we've got to understand uh, where the core of the issues in these two countries, at least. Is a fundamental thing wrong with the foreign policy or policies of the international community, it might be United States, some European country, and so on. Is this so-called one Iraq policy, one Syria policy? If you look at those two countries, the very core of the problem is because you cannot have one policy. You have diverse societies in both countries, both religiously, ethnic, as well as all the diversities are, are there. Of course, the situation is, if you go back five years, 10 years, you could see that, you got Kurd, you got Sunni, you got Shia, you got Christian, and so on. Now it got complicated by terrorism as well, international terrorism. So in Iraq, the dimension of international terrorism is a bit different. Uh, the, the, all the sectarian things there is still prominent, uh, compounded with uh, some terrorist activities, particularly more recently with the, before the Al-Qaeda and now uh, ISIS. In Syria, is actually that side of it is more complicated. The, the, the terrorism is becoming more prominent, more, uh, uh, and then there's a conflict with the central government. In Iraq, it's a little different. There the right is the issues between Erbil and Baghdad, issues about constitutional issues, post dictatorship issues, uh, whereby um, Baghdad is still carrying on with all policies and trying to create a new uh, centralized state. But, at the heart of it is the same conflict. So I think for tackling these issues, the international community needs to go beneath the surface of what, what is happening in these conflicts. It needs to go actually why, for example, I mentioned earlier, or why ISIS were supported in uh, Mosul, for example. They came with a few thousand people, suddenly swallowed, uh, I don't know, tens of thousands of people, taking on the whole Iraqi army, fighting, formidable force of Persian America. And we thought we used to be proud that we can't fight anybody. But nevertheless, these people came better equipped. Mm -hmm. Okay, we know why it is. And the reason for that is basically fed within, we like you or not, within this uh, enfranchised people that they mm -hmm. think they're better off with these people at least doing their fight against somebody, a common enemy. And that is the core of the issue. You have to tackle it. Otherwise, you will never beat these terrorists now. Mm -hmm. Yes, it helps bombing them. It helps cutting off their source of supply. But you also, politically, you've got to actually bankrupt them, which means you've got to create regimes post uh, whatever uh, Saddam or post Assad, whatever it might be, uh, to, to solve those core problems. So therefore, really, they need a system of governance that sharing the wealth sharing mm -hmm. the power in these two countries between all of them. So to be at peace with internally and to be at peace with their neighbor. For Kurds, it means really post-Muslim settlement of Iraq is different. We have Daesh in the middle, we have Baghdad, we have our neighbors. We are actually, all practical purposes, mm -hmm. independent from Baghdad. From border point, from security point of view, from crisis of humanitarian crisis, and actually, regrettably, financially, because we actually don't get even one dollar from them. Yes. So I don't know what we, what we are called now. I mean, are we uh, independent or not independent? We have to solve those problems out with Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, recognizing, I recognizing these hard questions that, for example, I'm sorry, taking another minute, if it was 30 seconds, the support until ISIS came in. I dearly associate myself with America as a, as a friend of Iraq, as a friend of Kurds particularly, mm -hmm. so I don't want to this come out wrongly. But one Iraq policy of the United States fed to extremism in Baghdad and Maliki's government that prevented the Kurds to be armed. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to get arms via Baghdad or directly by weapons openly. All of that was blocked because, no, no, if we get strong, we may have bigger dreams. And now when we face Daesh and all of that, the first comes to our help was America itself. But I wish we were given a little bit more help. Daesh would not have even matured 
-hmm. to a level that can fight as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So hopefully we'll end a lesson. Thank more. you. Unfortunately, I have come to the end of the session, so I'm going to ask the host minister, because this is the World Economic Forum, uh, Turkey, Turkey Summit, to make a one minute of a closing remarks, if you could just wrap us up for us uh, um, for today's panel. Thank you. We believe in the solution of regional problems. We see that various opportunities need to be assessed. We need to think about how we can use these opportunities to have a positive impact on the region. So how can we prevent the formation of problems or how can we solve these problems? Those are the questions we are concerned in mind. Various countries have various concerns. The North and the Sea have great discrepancies in income. The East and the West are different culturally. However, these are reconcilable differences. Taking all of these factors into consideration, there are some steps that can be taken. For example, there are some international organizations. For example, Mr. President brought up this issue a number of times. We need to question the structure of the United Nations. Someone else brought up this issue. There are problems around the world, and how will the UN take initiative on these issues? We are going through a process of globalization where everyone's affected by the problems as well as the solutions. So the question is, what kind of steps can we take to make sure that decisions are taken uh, more quickly? How can we ensure that uh, the solutions are more uh, conscious? For example, in uh, non-developed countries, in countries that are not developed, the rural areas used to constitute 90% of the population. Now we see that urban populations have reached 70 to 80%. There are also more and more young people, and these young people communicate with the rest of the world, and they have different demands from their governments. So we have to think about the structure of the UN. The UN structure is based on the post-World Second World War period, and it, the UN's current structure does not meet the world's needs now. So we need to have a institutional structure that can uh, prepare solutions for our modern problems. In other words, we need to change the structure of these international organizations. If we do that, it may be easier to take global initiatives. Another issue is as follows. How are we going to support whom? That is a key question. In these aspects, we need to think about the spirit of the times. Democracy is the rule of the people. So we need to make decisions that follow democracy. I think that a democratic decision would have a positive impact in many countries around the world. It will be well received by many countries around the world. So let's think about the regimes of the, mid, uh, of the Middle Ages. We can't use the regimes of the Middle Ages now simply because that was the status quo. The status quo need not be maintained. That would not solve our solution. So we need to think about contemporary problems. If there is a problem that needs to be solved, then what the world needs to do is, what the world we need to do is to make sure that we listen to the demands of the people. Let's promote the administration by the people. Let's promote democracy in these regions of conflict. We think that such an approach will be well accepted by the public. So international organizations need to be reformed. <laughs> this will help us set a target. So we need to ensure that there are discussions in areas of conflict. And these discussions should uh, focus on global policies that people find ethically acceptable. Thank you for taking part in today's panel, and thank you all for coming and for listening.